Today on The King is Coming. It's not just about figuring out the numbers. It's not just understanding the symbols or the events that are being predicted in the future. It's ultimately really all about the person of Jesus Christ Himself. Hello, I'm Ed Heinsen, and I want to be your teacher. I want to take the book of a Revelation and open it up and let God speak to your heart through it. Uh, the book of Revelation is really the book that tells us how it all ends. The book ends of the Bible, Genesis, how it all begins, and Revelation, how it all ends, really holds in the theological content of the message of the Bible from one end to the other. In other words, without the beginning, you'll never appreciate the ending, but without the end of the book, you'll never understand what the point of the story was really all about. When Jesus was here on earth, He said to the disciples that if I go back to heaven, I will come again and receive you unto Myself. That promise of the coming of Christ is spelled out for us in detail in the book of Revelation, and the interesting thing is, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not just about what is going to happen in the future. It's all about who is coming in the future. It's all about Jesus. Studying the book of Revelation not only helps us understand what's coming in the future, it helps us understand His work in our hearts and lives right now in the present. It's a book that draws us to worship the person of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Savior, the promised Messiah. We're going to start a journey in these next few weeks as we work our way through the book of the Revelation. And I'm going to try to take the complicated, make it simple so you'll understand it, so you'll say when we're done, wow, now I get it. It's really not that complicated at all. It's a message that reveals to me the person the power and the work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. To enhance our study in the book of Revelation, I've written a commentary on Revelation, over 240 pages, that'll walk you through every chapter. It follows the seven-point outline that we're suggesting, and it gives us an explanation of the terms that are used in the book. The symbols in Revelation, which take up nearly half the book, are not written to confuse us. They're actually written to help us understand, oh, this is the meaning, this is the point. The dragon or Jezebel or Babylon, what do all those things mean? Why are they so cryptically given in the book of Revelation? Well, they're given so that we could understand the book, and the commentary will help you understand what the symbols are all about and the meaning and purpose of the judgments, the meaning and purpose of the coming of the kingdom of God and the promise of the return of Christ who's coming back to reign and rule on earth and coming back for you and for me. The book of Revelation is the most fascinating book in all the Bible. It's certainly the most important prophetic book in the Bible. And what I want to invite you to do is get your Bible out, open it up to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible that tells us how it's all going to end. And uh, you might want to get a cup of coffee, uh, sit down with me, and uh, I'm going to walk you through the book for the next eight weeks to help us understand what is the message of this book really all about? It's the vision of the King, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, is the coming King who's destined to rule in our hearts on earth and ultimately in the New Jerusalem for all eternity. I'm also going to base a lot of our comments uh, on my commentary on Revelation that's entitled, 
Revelation Unlocking the Future. It'll give you a series of charts, books uh, to study, graphics, information, details that'll help you in your personal study of the book of the Revelation. But if you'll notice how it all begins, chapter 1, verse 1 says, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show unto his servants things that must shortly or literally quickly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So in the first verse alone, we know the title of the book, the revelation. Uh, the Greek word is apocalypse, uh, the revealing or the unveiling of the future. It is as though God is going to pull back the curtain of time and reveal to us what's coming in the future. He's going to give us a heavenly perspective on earthly events that are predicted in the book of Revelation. Uh, and then we know the human author is John. John the Apostle, the disciple, uh, the disciple that leaned on Jesus' shoulder at the Last Supper, uh, the only disciple who showed up at the cross, uh, the disciple to whom Jesus gave the care of his own mother. Uh, there is not a disciple that has a closer, more personal relationship to Jesus than John. And yet we're going to see by the end of chapter 1, John is on his face. He can't even stand in the presence of the risen, glorified Christ, who has to then invite him to stand up uh, and write down the message that he's about to reveal to him to show him what is going to happen in the future. And you'll notice also that you have a whole series of triplets in the book of the Revelation, a series of threes repeated over and over and over. This is one of the most amazing books ever written. Look at verse 2. It says of John that he bore record, first of all, of the Word of God. Uh, out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of them make references to the Old Testament, the Word of God. John is assuming his readers have read the Old Testament, that they're going to understand the significance of a symbol like the Lamb or a name like Jezebel or Babylon or whatever, uh, that there's meaning to these things and the symbolic language of Revelation is not meant to confuse us. It's actually meant to make the understanding of the book easier for us. He bore record, first of all, of the Word of God, secondly, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and thirdly, of all the things that he saw. If you like to mark things in your Bible, you might circle that word saw. It's a vision of what John saw in the future. There are times that he's taking his symbols from the Old Testament, the Word of God, from the New Testament, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and sometimes he's just writing down what he saw. We'll see one passage where he says something flew by, uh, it had a face like a man, long hair like a woman, and fire shot out the back end of it. I don't think he knew what that was. I think he was seeing some kind of modern weaponry in the distant future, and he just described it as best he could. He's trying to describe, at times, the indescribable with the words that are available to him, even under the inspiration of the Spirit back in the first century. So it's like somebody trying to write down everything they saw in a movie. Uh, Star Wars is showing and you're writing it down as quick as you can. And so there are times the Greek in the original is even a little bit garbled grammatically because he's literally giving you a I saw it this way kind of an account of what was appearing before his heart and mind in these chapters in the book of Revelation. And then you have another triplet in verse 3. He says, blessed is he that reads this, uh, they that hear the words of the prophecy, and those that keep the things that are written therein. The amazing thing about this book is it uses a whole series of numbers throughout. You have the signature of the sevens throughout the book. There are seven angels, seven uh, churches, seven trumpets, seven bowls of judgment. Uh, there are seven beatitudes in the book, seven blessings, etc. It's an amazingly written piece of literature from that standpoint, but it's the revelation of God's truth to us about the future. Uh, not only is the book organized uh, in that fashion, uh, but you have a whole series of 
threes and sevens and fours that are unique to the book of the Revelation. But I want to remind us from the very beginning, it's not just about figuring out the numbers. It's not just understanding the symbols or the events that are being predicted in the future. It's ultimately really all about the person of Jesus Christ Himself. It's His revelation to us of a message of the future. Now, the letters that are included in the book are addressed to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, the speaker uh, is calling himself, in verse 8, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, because the book's going to be written in the Greek language. In English, it would be like saying, I am the A and the Z. I'm the beginning and I'm the ending. I'm the all-consuming one, uh, the one that is the all-sufficient one, who is the Savior that can meet your needs at their deepest levels. And then John tells you in verse 9 uh, that he was a prisoner on the island of Patmos, sent there because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's going to refer to Jesus uh, as the faithful witness. Now, the Greek word for witness is the word martyria, from which we get the English word martyr, uh, that a person who gives a witness, a testimony. You'll hear a preacher sometimes say, could I get a witness? In the ancient Christian world, that meant you had to be willing to stand up for what you believed, even if it was going to cost you your life. Uh, the witness was giving a testimony of his faith and confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. And John is reminding us Jesus himself is ultimately the faithful witness, the one who gave his life on our behalf, the one who died in our place. And yet he's going to picture him in this first chapter as the risen Savior, the glorified Savior. He's the one who's going to appear to John on the island of Patmos. Patmos sits out in the Aegean Sea, about 40 miles off the coast of what today is Turkey. It's about 40 miles from Ephesus, where John was serving as the pastor of the local church, the church planted by the Apostle Paul, pastored later by Timothy, and then by John. There's not a church in the New Testament that has a greater heritage than the Ephesian church. And yet, as persecution breaks out at the end of the first century, the Emperor Domitian banishes John to the island of Patmos off the coast. At this point in time, John is the last living disciple. All of the rest have given their lives for their testimony, their witness, their martyria of Christ. Instead of martyring John, the Roman Empire sends him out to the island as a prisoner, thinking, there, we'll abandon you on the island. But John will soon discover he's not alone on that island because it's there that he's going to have a vision of the king and it's there that we see Jesus appearing to him. He says uh, that he heard a voice speaking to him and you might circle the word, the voice. Uh, and he turned and he said, I, I wanted to know who's speaking to me. And I saw seven golden candlesticks like a Jewish menorah. And then as he looks more closely, there in the midst of the candlesticks was one like the Son of Man, clothed in a garment or a robe down to the feet, with a golden sash about his waist. He's describing the garments of the high priest. He sees Jesus as the high priest of heaven, our ultimate intercessor before the Father. He also sees him as the Lord of the churches, that are symbolized by the seven candlesticks. In other words, where is Jesus today? He's in the midst of His church. He is our glorious high priest. He is the one to whom we pray in His name as we approach the Father. And then He describes Him and says, His head and His hairs were like white wool, purity as white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass, uh, as though they burned in a furnace. His voice was as the sound of many waters, with power and with authority. 
And he held in his right hand seven stars, and in his mouth there was a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, the sword becomes the symbol of the Word of Christ. And Jesus is going to appear again and again throughout this book, always with the sword. The sword that says the authority of the Word of God speaks to the issues of what's happening on earth, of mankind down below. And then he says, and his countenance, his face, was shining like the sun in all of its brilliance. I've tried to describe it in my commentary uh, this way, uh, that you have this sevenfold description of the person of Christ in this chapter. The hair is white, the eyes are on fire, the feet are like burning bronze, the voice like many waters, in his hand are the stars, and in his mouth the sword, and his face is shining like the sun. Here is the risen, glorified Savior revealing Himself to John the disciple. And yet it's been nearly 60 years now since the resurrection. And John says, When I saw Him in all of His glory, in all of His power, in verse 17 He says, I fell at His feet like I was dead. Don't think it's going to be a casual thing one day to say, well, here I am in heaven. Where's Jesus? I want to meet Him. If John is on his face before Him, where do you think you and I will be? John sees Him in all of His deity, in all of His glory, in all of His power. And yet, Jesus reaches out with His right hand, the nail-scarred hand, because after the resurrection, He still had the nail prints in His hand touches him on the shoulder, in essence to say, John, you're not alone. You're not abandoned. I have come for you. I have work for you to do. Stand up. Get up. Get out of parchment. Get out a pen. We're going to write a book that will change the course of history, the book of the Revelation. This first chapter is filled with the power of the presence of the person of Jesus Christ Himself. And yet it's a very unique book in every way. In this book of the Revelation, we're not only going to see the signature of the sevens, uh, seven visions, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven symbolic players in the end times drama, seven bowls, seven judgments, and ultimately seven triumphs. The title of the book, again, The Revelation of Jesus Christ. The time is imminent, the writer says. These things are suddenly going to happen one day, quickly, instantly. It doesn't mean we can set a date on it. What it means is, when it finally occurs, it's going to come in rapid succession, instantly and quickly. The theme of the book, Behold, I am coming again. I will keep my promise that you will not be left alone at the time of the end. I will come for you. And the triumph is that of this glorified Savior. One of the unique things in the book of Revelation that we'll discover is the word and appears 1,200 times in this book, more than any other book of the Bible. It's the little Greek word chi. Uh, and scholars have identified it as what we call the chiameter pattern of the book. He will say this happened, and then this, and then next this, and then this, and then this. He'll tie lists of seven things together, like seven churches, with six ands. The church at Ephesus, and Pergamos, and Thyatira, etc. Uh, four uh, items are connected by three ands seven items by six ands, etc. All of that is telling us there's a sense of movement in the book, uh, that it's not an endless cycle of events. We're moving historically from one event to another, to another, to another. This happened, and then this happened, and next this happened, and we're moving toward a climax. The climax having to do with the rule of Christ as He finally returns to earth. But before He comes, many of these things have to be expressed to us so that we understand 
the nature of what is going on in the book. Our study of Revelation is going to be a fascinating study because we're going to be focused on the person of Jesus. It's a revelation of Him. Who is He really? Now, in the ancient Christian world, there was a tendency to picture Jesus basically only three ways in Christian art. He was a baby in His mother's arms, or He was dying on a cross, or He was coming in judgment on the world. In medieval art, it's the Madonna and the child, the Savior on the cross, or the coming judge. The idea that He was a living Savior who loves you, who has a plan and a purpose for your life, who cares about you deeply, was often lost. Uh, the idea of a personal Savior that wants to have a personal relationship with you as an individual. Now, there are a lot of people who study the book of Revelation because they're all excited about these events that are coming in the future. Boy, I want to know what's going to happen and uh, how does this book of Revelation give me a glimpse of these future events? Well, all of that is included in the book, but ultimately, it's a glimpse of Him, the person who is the living Savior, who rules from heaven today in the hearts of believers so that we, like John, can say we're part of His kingdom. John's going to tell us, I was there on the island of Patmos, a prisoner of the Roman government, but I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. My king is alive in heaven, and my king is coming again one day to earth to reign and to rule. But before he comes to reign and rule on earth, we need to know that he's reigning and ruling in our hearts and in our lives. So as we begin this study of Revelation, I want to invite you to open your heart and your mind to the coming King. Jesus Christ claims to be the living Son of God. I and the Father are one, He will say. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. He promises that He's coming again in the Father's name. He's coming to rule on the earth. He's coming to rule in eternity. But in the meantime, He wants to rule in your heart, in your life. And if you really want to understand the book of Revelation, open your heart to Him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to trust You as my personal Savior, as my coming King. I'm going to put my future destiny in Your hands because that's where it's safe, that's where it's secure, and that's where I can confidently know I'm going to have a relationship with You forever. I'm going to have an eternal destiny in that new Jerusalem this book talks about, in that heavenly eternal city that's coming in the future. Because the promise of the gospel is Jesus died for your sins, He rose from the dead, He's coming again, and He wants to give you the gift of eternal life. But at some point, you and I have to say yes to that offer. Indeed, we're going to discover the King is coming. The question is, is He coming for you? People always want to know what in the world is going to happen in the future. If we're studying Bible prophecy, what does it tell us is coming in the future? Well, I've written this book, 15 Future Events That Will Shake the World, to study those 15 things in the Bible that the Scripture clearly tells us are going to come in the future. This book is packed with biblical information, practical insights. It's going to inform your mind, but it's also going to thrill your heart and challenge your soul. Get a copy today. There are a lot of people today who say, oh, the rapture, it's not in the Bible, or this is a new idea, or where in the world do you get this thing from? Zap, people are out of here all of a sudden? Well, Dr. Mark Hitchcock and I have just written our newest book, Can We Still Believe in the Rapture? We're going back to the biblical text to say, what does the Bible say about the rapture? What did the early church say about it? What have Christians said about it all through the Middle Ages, the time of the Reformation, even up to today? It's not a brand new idea. It's been around for centuries. Is there a difference between the time we're caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and the time we return with Christ to the earth to reign and rule with Him? And if so, what should we be doing differently in the meantime in light of the message of the promise of the blessed hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ 
to rapture the church home to the Father's house. My guest today is Dr. Mark Hitchcock, an expert on Bible prophecy. Mark, when we study the book of Revelation, it has a lot to say about wrath. The judgments that are coming are the wrath of the Lamb and the wrath of God. How do those wrath passages relate to believers as opposed to unbelievers? Well, when you think about what those scriptures tell us about the church of Jesus Christ, it tells us that we're not appointed to wrath. In fact, in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says that the Lord Jesus is coming to deliver us from that coming wrath. And I don't think the wrath there's the wrath of hell. I think it's in the context of the book of Thessalonians, it's that wrath of the future day of the Lord, a time of tribulation that's coming. Yeah, the so Thessalonians it, message seems to be set in an eschatological framework. It it's all about the coming of Christ. Right, and he says he's going to come, and by his coming, he's going to deliver us from the wrath. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, we're not appointed unto wrath. Now, all of the, all the views of the timing of the rapture, whether you believe Jesus is going to come back before the tribulation or the middle of the tribulation, or the end of the tribulation, they all agree that we're exempt from wrath. So the question is, when does the wrath start? And, and what, uh, what means will God use to deliver us from that wrath? And you and I would both agree that the whole time of future tribulation is a time of God's wrath. It's not just the last half or right. the very end of it. The whole time period is God's wrath. And if it's all God's wrath and we're delivered from the wrath, then we have to be taken out before, before that time period begins. Now, you've got to get the church out of here, up to heaven, to the marriage before she's ready to return with Christ. And what happens in between that time seems to be that time of tribulation and judgment in the book of Revelation because it keeps saying as Jesus opens the seals it's the wrath of the Lamb and then later the bold judgments are clearly called the wrath of God and those wrath passages seem to be talking about the unsaved world. No, that's right. And, and you know, we all agree that the wrath gets worse as you go along through the tribulation. It's ratcheted up. The, the, uh, the birth pangs get closer together and they get stronger. But that doesn't mean that at the beginning it's still not God's wrath because even the seal judgments that open the tribulation, those are being opened by the Lamb. So those are God's wrath being poured out on the earth. And if we're exempt from that wrath, then... The Bible, I think, is clear that we're going to be taken up before this time of wrath comes, which supports the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. And I think it emphasizes, too, those passages that say he's going to come like a thief in the night uh, to snatch the church away, uh, to take us out of here. Why? You don't, if you're going to go through the time of tribulation, you don't need to come in like a thief in the night. Uh, it'll be obvious what you're going through. But if you're exempt from the time of tribulation and the wrath, then it makes perfect sense that Jesus would come instantly, suddenly, to take us home to be with Him before He declares war on the world that's left behind. World Prophetic Ministry is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and your gift is tax deductible for the amount that exceeds any fair market value of the materials or resources you receive from us. Thank you for your support.